So I'll first open and talk about the, uh, the first uh, group of pathogens, which is going to be, uh, in this specific case, black rot. This is, a, this is a list of symptoms of black rot. You can see here, I would like to just um, briefly emphasize to you that the pathogen in this specific case is uh, very well known to overwinter on these big cankers that it causes. As you can see on the left side, and then also it overwinters very well in the mummified fruit, especially the ones that are left after thinning agents that sometimes cause higher percentage of mummified fruit that don't fall off. And uh, typical symptom of the frog eye leaf spot that you see here on Cortland, and sometimes these uh, uh, brown or black patches that look like specks sometimes where the infections happened. But the most common one that you know you would probably see besides the frog eye leaf spot would be the symptom on the fruit. And this rot specifically is a uh, uh, firmer rot. It's spherical, so meaning that the fruit does not uh, sh change shape. And it's a drier rot. So when you cut into it, you know, you don't see too much um, uh, soaky, uh, soaking, soaking of the tissue. The frog eye leaf spot can become severe very close to the cankers, which you see on the left, and sometimes the leaves can cup and curl. Uh, you know, giving you an idea that the canker might not be actually from fire blade, but actually from, from black rot. So this is the life cycle of the pathogen. Um, on the left top corner, you can actually see these uh, pear-like structures with an opening on the top, which is basically the sexual reproductive structure that we call um, perithesia, in which we have ascospores that are uh, spores uh, you know, uh, formed by sexual reproduction, which are ejected in the spring, along with the other fruiting body that is right next to it, which are pycnidia. And uh, conidia, asexual spores form in them, and they are also released with rain, and they can be splashed or uh, wind-driven to new leaf tissue, such as leaves very close to the fruit mummies or cankers that actually hold these fruiting bodies. Once the spores le uh, reach the leaves and fruit, which you see in the top middle part of the graph, you can have infections leading towards the symptoms of uh, frog eye leaf spot. Sometimes rarely you can see infections on wood as well. Uh, and eventually uh, the symptoms occur on fruit and the rots uh, usually uh, lead towards uh, desiccation of the fruit when, and basically you see the fruit as a fruit mummy. And that fruit also, along with the cankers and the wood, uh, serves as a source of overwintering inoculum. So basically the brush on the ground and also the dead cankers and the big limbs on the wood. Anywhere that, where there was damaged wood, uh, this fungus inhabits and can actually overwinter there as mycelium, which is a hair-like structure in which the pathogen grows, and then also as perithesia and pycnidia, these, these two uh, fruiting bodies that you see on the left uh, middle side of, the, of this image. So this is the way how pathogen basically cycles every year. You can have, multi you can have multiple cycles of release of these conidia, and only one cycle of ascospores being released. And uh, besides the overwintering that I mentioned to you, um, uh, usually what happens is that uh, it can also be present on the trunk and dead brush. So good uh, sanitation in the orchard is essential to uh, get this pathogen under control and make sure that your fungicides are highly effective when you reduce the inoculum. The infection usually uh, happens if the infection pressure from last year is high, it can happen as early as, uh, as uh, early spring. But the, in most cases, it's usually when the warm rains start during the spring. And as I said, the sources of inoculum are Praethesia and Pycnidia. Most of the time, the period that, you know, usually people start lo uh, uh, looking at them because the, the fungicides become a little bit more sparse at the time is from petal fall to harvest. But in the untreated checks that we have at the lab uh, here in Highland, we can see infections as early as early spring because we don't treat those trees with any fungicides. So um, it can also cause dormant infections, meaning that after the infection has set in, the pathogen lays dormant for some time and then it reactivates with the fruit, mat fruit maturation. And it seems that fruit ripening definitely allows pathogen to be reactivated and cause the rot. And um, it's definitely a, a pathogen that is a minor uh, issue in many orchards. It is endemic, it's present in almost all the orchards, but is largely controlled by different fungicides that we apply for scab and for powdery mildew and other issues that we had early in the spring. 
So thinning can contribute to formation of the mummies, which this top pathogen inhabits. And eventually, sometimes you can have lenticel issues with infection from this pathogen on semi-mature fruit during the summer that some people actually can uh, mix up with other, uh, uh, other causes of damage, such as phytotoxicity and lenticel breakdown issues. And these lenticel spots sometimes are deceiving, um, but, but they're actually, you know, in, in some cases, uh, black rot. And then later, if these are uh, not if these are not taken care of, the fungicides are not you know um, uh, fungicide coverage is not maintained. These can continue to develop and decay in storage. And the uh, lenticel spots, you know, uh, can be caused not only by black rot, but by, by also by the by the white rot fungus, which I'm going to talk next. And uh, also, in very rare cases, bitter rot fungi from Colitotricum genus can cause those small spots. So it's kind of difficult always to diagnose those spots, and you know, to, and to pinpoint them as as uh, you know as a direct cause. So I'll, I'll briefly switch now to white rot. I wish to emphasize to you that white rot is a disease that carries the name, of course, of the symptom of the fruit, which you see on the right side. And you know, this white rot is quite uh, more wet and soft and soggy and drippy uh, in, in comparison to the black rot. But sometimes the symptoms can very be similar. It can be very similar in dry uh, parts of the year, so you can't really distinguish them. But, but one thing that really stands out is the symptoms you see on the left side, the purplish to brown patches you can see on the bark. Um, and uh, this is actually caused by Butrosphera dithidia, which is an, an opportunistic pathogen, meaning that it requires the tree to be weakened uh, by some abiotic or biotic factor. And then in those cases, uh, the uh, tissue that is weakened is a perfect tissue for this pathogen to inhabit. So it lives and dwells on the surface of the bark uh, as an opportunistic uh, fungus. And then if it does see an opportunity by weakening the immune system of the plant, it moves in and causes these, these patches. And eventually you can see these cankers that sometimes might deceive you that this might be from fire blight, but actually this is just because uh, the trees were not taken care of very well or irrigated to allow good, um, uh, uh, good health of the tree and, and then allowed these cankers to form. The white rot fungus is caused by, by the fungus, the white rot fungus is called Botrysphere dothidia. It also overwinter, overwinters in the same mode as black rot, as Peritesia, and mycelium and, and canidia in the, in the pycnidia uh, as fruiting bodies. Uh, it causes infections during the hot summer days. And it, the, as I mentioned, the rot is slightly different from, from the black rot being more drippy and, 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 uh, and more soft. It usually causes irregular margins in the fruit. And the, what is really interesting is that um, sometimes when it's drier, white rot can be very similar to black rot, but usually if you cut the fruit, you can find that the, uh, that the rot is more of a cylindrical shape, which would indicate on a white rot versus the black rot. So it causes also these bark cankers that I mentioned to you, and that's also where the pathogen survives in overwinters. And that flaky bark on the trunk is sometimes associated also with herbicides. And the way how probably this works together, based on research that has been done in the 80s, is that most likely the herbicides that uh, hit the trunks because of the uh, nozzles that are not directed to the ground, might allow desiccation of the bark, which then stresses that bark tissue and allows this pathogen to become more dominant on the bark and cause these patches. And it seems that whenever the trees are stressed because of the lack of water or desiccation by the herbicides, this pathogen gets really active and uh, reactive and then causes these black patches. So and it seems to be that uh, you know, research is lacking there yet to prove that there is a connection between herbicides and Botrysia but there's a definite connection between the drought stress, meaning if the trees are not, in their, um, not really well irrigated and on time, irrigated on time, would allow this pathogen to become something that might you know, cause more issues on, on the bark and on the trunk. How would you approach the management? Well, uh, first of all, as I mentioned, the good orchard sanitation is important. You should definitely remove the brush and uh, burn the brush or bury it if you can. Definitely cut out the cankers and, and remove the mummies if you can from the trees. And especially do that uh, during the time of winter pruning when there is a chance to do that. Just leaving the brush or the mummies on the ground is not going to help because the, the inoculum is right there. So it needs to be taken out or buried. 
If you can, you should avoid putting stubs because uh, any damaged tissue or stress tissue with, with stubs there might be a perfect environment for these fungi to inhabit that, that tissue and allow inoculum to be high up in the canopy, allowing infections. If you can, when you're picking, you should prevent fruit bruising because the pathogen can be spread, spread from, from the other fruit that you're picking uh, on the new fruit. We are largely dependent on fungicides to control these, these fungi and the FRAC11 group or the group 11 that you would see on the label as a number, the uh, quinone outside inhibitors, which would be your Flint, Pristine, Marivon, are the ones that are very effective against these fungi, uh, uh, both of them, and thiophanates, which is your thio uh, topsin or thiophanate methyl is very effective, and also the captain is very effective against because it's a multi-site concrete activity, and you should always mix those two against these fungi. But if I would go and uh, you know, list the top choice products, definitely Topsin M or Captain would be a really good choice. Uh, however, remember that even though it does control black and white rot, it does, uh, Topsin is not really known to have any control or you know, really satisfactory control, even close to being satisfactory on bitter rot, which I'm gonna talk about you know, next. But if you see this list here, anything from Flint, Luna Sensation, Maribon, Sobran, and Pristine are very effective. Uh, and then you should always apply these products along with Captain. Primarily, these products are applied in, um, you know, usually to control bitter rot. And then somehow, you know, they are sometimes used against powdery mildew because the, the QOI fungicide that I mentioned, the FRAC11, are very effective against powdery mildew. So if you had issues with powdery mildew last year, some people would uh, use these products uh, at pink or petal fog, and that way, in that way, contribute towards the control of black and white rot. But you know, uh, being that the black, uh, that the bitter rot is more uh, bigger, bigger issue, these fungicides are effective against bitter rot, and we're gonna talk about that later, and also very effective against Sudwatch and Flyspec, we, we tend to reserve them for the cover sprays later in the season to control bitter rot primarily. So one thing that uh, we do recommend, at least in the Hudson Valley region, is that we usually uh, never recommend that a grower should surpass the deadline around the 10th July, because if the fungicides that are effective against the rots are missed from that date on, it seems there is more issues with, the, with, with different rots. And that's just based on you know, historical uh, weather conditions. You know, if you do apply these fungicides, uh, really you have to recover every time when you get accumulated two inches of rain in a single event or multiple events. And the residue has to be maintained on fruit until harvest. So some of the late varieties such as uh, Pink Ladies and uh, Granny Smiths, if anybody grows those or Golden Delicious, they need to be covered up until the time when they're harvested. Especially uh, organic orchards are the, is the are, you know, they're definitely the place where these are an issue. And people are really dependent there on liquid lime sulfur for sulibotch and fly spec control. In those cases, the addition of oil to liquid lime sulfur allows the damage to fruit skin, which then in turn leads toward uh, more uh, you know, of these fungi, black rot and white rot, like to uh, establish more there. So in those cases, um, you know, the, it, it just, it's, it's a, tough, a tough call when you have an organic production. In general, if we do have um, injury on the fruit surface, that just, that's, that's gonna contribute to the worsening of rots in the orchard and you should avoid trying to have that. So any insects that can be present there are not welcome because they contribute, contribute also to the spread of these diseases there too. 